I've always considered myself a rational person, someone who favors logic over superstition. But what I experienced in the summer of 2020 shook the very foundation of my beliefs. I moved into the old Grantham building on the edge of downtown, lured by its cheap rent and vintage charm. My unit, apartment 33, was a cozy one bedroom, perfect for someone like me. The walls, however, were as thin as parchment, a fact I learned on my first night when the soft sounds of crying seeped through from apartment 34 next door. The crying wasn't constant, but it was regular always starting around midnight and fading with the first light of dawn. After a few sleepless nights, I approached the building's superintendent, Mr. Hobb, an aging man with a permanent scowl etched across his face. Apartment 34? No one's lived there for months, he grumbled when I asked him about my neighbor. Last tenant was a young woman, Sarah. One day, just vanished without a trace left most of her things behind, including a diary. A diary? I pressed. Curiosity peaked. He shrugged, his eyes darting away. Some say she was into some strange stuff. I don't pay attention to gossip. If you're so interested, go take a look for yourself. Just be careful. That evening, armed with the key Mr. Hobb had reluctantly handed over, I entered apartment 34. The air was stale, heavy with the scent of abandonment. The furniture was draped in white sheets, giving the room a ghostly appearance. In the bedroom, I found the diary on a small writing desk, its leather cover worn. I began to read, and with each page, Sarah's words drew me deeper into her world. She wrote of voices whispering at night, not crying, but speaking in a language she couldn't understand. She wrote of her dreams, where shadowy figures roamed the corridors of the building, their faces blurred and indistinct, but it was her final entry that sent chills down my spine. They are in the walls, she had scrawled, her handwriting shaky. They're waiting for someone to listen, someone like me. As I read those words, the crying started again. Only this time, it was louder, more desperate. I closed the diary, my heart racing, and that's when I noticed the soft, almost imperceptible parting of the wallpaper near the floorboard. Curiosity overcame my fear, and I peeled it back, revealing a narrow crevice. The crying grew louder, and I realized it was emanating from within the walls. Without thinking, I reached in, my fingers brushing against something cold and metallic. A small tape recorder, old and covered in dust. I pressed play, and Sarah's voice filled the room, her crying clear and unmistakable. The recording was a loop, her last moments forever captured in a haunting echo. I recoiled, dropping the device as realization dawned on me. Sarah hadn't vanished. She had been driven to madness. I fled the apartment, the tape recorder's wails echoing in my ears. Back in my own apartment, I tried to convince myself it was all some sick joke, but sleep eluded me. The next morning, I handed in my notice to Mr. Hobb, unwilling to spend another night within those walls. As I packed my things, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The walls seemed to press in closer, and I wondered if Sarah had felt the same oppressive gaze in her final days. The Grantham building still stands, its secrets buried deep within its walls. And sometimes, when the city is quiet, I swear I can still hear Sarah's cries, a chilling reminder of the unknown that lurks just beyond what we see. I always thought there was a benign mystery to Mr. Thompson, the elderly gentleman next door. With his perpetually calm demeanor and gentle smile, he seemed the epitome of a kindly neighbor. That perception shattered one unsettling night, changing everything I thought I knew about solitude and sanity. 
It was well past midnight when my sleep was interrupted by the faint, irregular flickering that seeped through my bedroom curtains. Groggy and slightly annoyed, I peered out, assuming a streetlight was on the fritz again. Instead, my gaze was drawn to Mr. Thompson's house, specifically to his basement, where the light stuttered like the pulse of a disturbed heart. What I saw next rooted me to the spot. A series of shadows cast against the thin curtains of the basement window. They were human figures, immobile and oddly positioned, creating a bizarre, chilling scene. The sight prickled my skin with dread. My first thought was to call Mr. Thompson, fearing he might be in some sort of trouble. But the late hour and the eerie nature of those silhouettes held me back. Instead, I decided to wait until morning. Perhaps the daylight would dispel the night's fears, as it often does. Morning light brought no relief. The scene from the night before had seared itself into my mind, and I could no longer hold back my concern, or my curiosity. Just as I was brewing my coffee, a flurry of police cars converged on Mr. Thompson's home. The quiet morning broke into a cacophony of sirens and commanding shouts. From my window, I watched as officers swarmed his property. Later, neighbors huddled together, whispering anxiously as police carried out what looked like mannequins, disturbingly realistic figures, each arranged with meticulous care. Mr. Thompson was led away in handcuffs, a bewildered look on his face that did not reach his eyes, which remained disturbingly empty. The full story unfolded over the next few days. The mannequins found in Mr. Thompson's basement were dressed in clothes belonging to missing persons, some of whom had vanished decades ago. Each figure was posed in a tableau that mimicked family gatherings, a dinner scene, a board game in progress, a silent, static party where no laughter would ever resonate. It was as if Mr. Thompson had tried to capture and preserve moments of life, an artificial snapshot stained by the reality of his crimes. The community reeled from the revelation. The gentle old man who waved from his garden was a collector of souls, crafting a silent, eerie world beneath our feet. The basement lights, the flickering that had drawn me to the window, turned out to be a fault in the old wiring, innocuous yet instrumental in unveiling the macabre truth. I now keep my curtains tightly drawn as night falls, a feeble barrier between myself and the world's hidden horrors. Sometimes, when the neighborhood is shrouded in darkness, I find my gaze drifting to the now silent house next door, and I shudder, wondering about the thin, wavering line between loneliness and madness. For in the quiet moments, I can almost hear the whispered echoes of those still gatherings in Mr. Thompson's basement, forever poised in a grim pantomime of life. I always believed that old Mr. Thompson next door was just another lonely soul in our small town. His house, a time-worn structure with peeling paint and overgrown ivy, seemed as harmless as he did. A retired tailor, he lived quietly, and his interactions with the neighborhood were few but polite. Late one September night, sleep eluded me. My window provided a view directly into Mr. Thompson's basement, a space I'd never seen lit until that night. The flickering lights caught my eye, odd sporadic flashes that danced across the drawn shades. What I saw next chilled my blood. Silhouettes, dozens of them. They were motionless, eerily poised as if caught in a moment of time. My heart raced as I stared, trying to make sense of the scene. Were there people in his basement? Was Mr. Thompson in trouble? Or was it something darker? The next morning, my curiosity and fear got the best of me. I called the police with a trembling voice, narrating my observations. It wasn't long before the street buzzed with the noise of sirens and flashing lights. Mr. Thompson was led away in handcuffs, a look of defeated acceptance on his face. The police later informed the neighborhood of the discovery, 
an assembly of mannequins, each dressed meticulously in clothes identified as belonging to missing persons from over the years. But the story doesn't end there. That night, after Mr. Thompson's arrest, his house sat dark and empty, a haunting specter in the moonlight. My curiosity, now mixed with a morbid sense of duty, led me back to my window. The basement was lit once again, despite the absence of its owner. I watched, frozen in place, as the silhouettes appeared once more, shifting subtly, as if breathing. I dialed the police in a panic. When they arrived, the lights were dead again, and the basement empty save for the grotesque mannequins. No sign of life, no flickering lights, nothing. The officers, frustrated and skeptical, warned me against prank calls and left, leaving me staring into the deep, dark void of the house next door. Days turned to weeks, and an unsettling pattern emerged. Every night the basement lit up, revealing the silent watchers. And every time the authorities or anyone else checked, the lights were out, the basement barren except for those mannequins. Driven by a mix of terror and resolve, I decided to investigate myself. I waited for the cover of darkness, armed only with a flashlight and my phone. The door creaked ominously as I pushed it open, the smell of mildew and something fouler hitting me instantly. The basement was stifling, the air thick with the stench of decay. The mannequins were there, just as I had seen from my window but up close they were horrifying. Details too precise, too human. Some had hair, others had features that seemed too lifelike under my trembling light. I approached one, the air growing colder, the oppressive silence of the room punctuated by my labored breathing. As I reached out to touch it, to confirm my growing horror that these were not just mannequins, the basement erupted in shrieks. The figures began to move, stiffly, jerkily, turning towards me. Their eyes, glassy yet alive, stared back at me. I stumbled backward, my scream catching in my throat. I ran, not looking back, not stopping until I burst into the safety of my own home. I called the police again, my words a jumble of incoherent pleas. When they arrived, they found nothing but the mannequins, static and lifeless as ever. No one believed me, but I know what I saw. Those weren't just mannequins in Mr. Thompson's basement. They were his watchers, his creations, somehow brought to life by whatever dark craft he practiced. And though Mr. Thompson never returned, and his house remains empty to this day, sometimes late at night, I see the flickering lights. The watchers are still there, waiting in the shadows, and I know they see me too. Every night at precisely 8.30, I'd take Buster out for his walk, a ritual more for his pleasure than mine. Our route was predictable, skirting the edge of our sleepy little suburb, past rows of neatly kept gardens, and the same familiar windows glowing orange in the twilight. Most of our neighbors were shadows behind curtains, but not Mr. Dennett. He was always there, at his living room window, a smile plastered across his face. It was odd, sure, but in a town where the most exciting event was the annual bake sale, odd was a welcome flavor. At first I chuckled about it to my wife, remarking how Mr. Dennett must really enjoy his evening people watching. But as the days turned to weeks, his unblinking stare and unwavering grin began to unsettle me. He never moved, just stood there smiling as Buster and I passed by. I tried waving a couple of times, but his smile never reached his eyes, which remained cold and distant. Then, one drizzly October evening, something changed. As Buster tugged on his leash, eager to chase the scent of a rabbit or some other nocturnal critter, I noticed Mr. Dennett wasn't at his usual post. A small relief, I thought, 
until I felt the prickling sensation of being watched. Turning, I caught sight of him at a different window, one further along the street, still smiling, still staring. Picking up the pace, I convinced myself it was a coincidence. He must be moving from room to room doing whatever it is that kept him so eerily entertained. But with each turn we took, and at every window we passed, there he was. The smiling man, appearing as if materialized from thin air, his grin wide and terrifying. That night, I barely slept. Each creak and sigh of our house set my heart racing, images of that unchanging smile haunting the edges of my dreams. The next evening, I was hesitant to go out, but Buster, ever the creature of habit, was insistent. As we approached Mr. Dennett's house, I noticed the curtains were drawn, a first. Maybe he'd finally tired of his strange hobby, or perhaps he'd simply gone out. Either way, it was a relief not to meet those eyes. But as we passed the last lamppost near his property, I realized the air felt different, thicker somehow, charged with a silent tension. I turned involuntarily, a sense of dread washing over me. There he was, his face pressed against the glass, his eyes wide, mouth agape. The smile was gone, replaced by a look of such raw, unadulterated terror, it stopped me in my tracks. Buster growled, a low sound I'd never heard him make, his body rigid with alarm. We rushed home, and I locked the doors, double-checking each window. I didn't sleep at all, jumping at shadows listening to the silence of the house. Morning brought police sirens and the murmur of curious neighbors. Mr. Dennett was dead. Found in the same spot he used to stand and smile, his face twisted in horror. The police had no answers. There was no sign of forced entry, no disturbances in the dusty room. It was as if the life had been scared right out of him. In the weeks that followed, the street felt different, quieter. I kept walking Buster at the same time each night, perhaps out of a sense of defiance against the fear that lingered like a bad smell. But the real change came when I noticed other neighbors at their windows, smiling as we passed. Their expressions were benign at first, but as the days wore on, their smiles grew too wide, their stares too intent. And then, one evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon and the shadows stretched out long and thin across the pavement, I felt it again, that prickling sensation of being watched. I turned slowly, dread creeping up my spine, to see every window filled with a smiling face. None of them blinked, not even once. And somewhere, in the back of my mind, a terrible realization began to dawn. Smiling wasn't a gesture of friendliness, but a mask, a shield against something unseen, something that prowled in the periphery, just beyond the glass, hungry and unseen. Tonight, as the clock ticks toward 8.30, I wonder how long until I too stand at the window, smiling against the dark. From the moment we moved into the old Warwick house in the serene streets of Hawthorne Lane, I felt an unsettling quiet pervade our lives. We had left behind the incessant rush of the city for what we believed was a fresh start. A quieter chapter for me, my wife Amelia, and our two children, Lucy and Sam. The house itself was a beautiful Victorian structure, large bay windows, a captivating facade, and a history as old as the town itself. The neighbors seemed friendly, albeit a bit reserved, attributing their distance to the usual small town caution. Three days after our move, nestled among the welcome notes and housewarming cards, we found the first letter. It was crudely wrapped, an unremarkable brown envelope, but it was the content that chilled our bones. The letter was from someone calling themselves the Watcher. My dear family, 
I see you found the place of your dreams, and rightfully taken your place in its history. I have been in charge of watching this house for decades, and now, I have you to watch over. It read. I initially dismissed it as a tasteless prank, but as the days passed, more letters came, each growing more detailed. The little one, with her curls, she loves to play by the old oak tree, doesn't she? And your boy, how he hides his diary under the second floorboard from the left in his room. This invasion of our privacy terrified us. We notified the police, who assured us they'd handle the matter. They mounted patrols, installed surveillance, and even monitored our mail. However, nothing concrete surfaced. No fingerprints, no leads, no suspects. The letters continued, each one more intrusive, more unsettling. It was lovely watching you all gather by the fireplace last Thursday. The joy of family truly is a warmth to behold. Fear turned into paranoia. We kept the children indoors, curtained off the windows, and started second-guessing every shadow. Amelia, usually so strong, began to unravel. The kids sensed our fear and cloistered themselves in their rooms, their laughter replaced by whispers. One night, driven to desperation, I decided to stake out the front yard from my study, which overlooked the street. As the clock ticked past midnight, my eyes heavy with exhaustion, I spotted a figure standing across the street, shrouded in darkness. Every instinct screamed to confront this voyeur, but before I could move, the figure vanished as quickly as it had appeared. Weeks turned into months, and the letters never ceased, even as police interest waned. Why do you keep looking for me? I'm nowhere yet everywhere. I am the eyes you feel when the room is empty, the presence in the silence of your home. Unable to endure the psychological torment, we made the heartbreaking decision to move. The house went on the market, but no buyers came. Neighbors whispered, the stigma of the haunted house growing with each passing day. We settled in a new town, miles away, but the scars remained. We installed security systems, but every creak of the new house, every whisper of the wind, seemed like the watcher, reminding us of his gaze. Our lives were irrevocably changed. As I write this, a part of me wonders if the watcher was ever real, or merely a fragment of our collective hysteria. But then, I remember the precision of the observations, the intimate details no stranger could know. The house on Hawthorne Lane stands empty, a monument to our terror. Sometimes in the quiet of the night I find myself pondering, were we the only ones watched? Or was the whole town under the gaze of someone, or something, unseeable yet omnipresent? The unease lingers, a chilling reminder that some watchers might never be found. <laughs>